I'll take your Bibles and turn with me to James chapter 5. We're going to be in James chapter 5 tonight if you want to find your place there. All right, James chapter 5, I'm in verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Drive through Christianity. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you again tonight, Lord, and I'm asking you to please just uh, give me what you want me to say tonight and the power by your Holy Spirit to preach it. I pray, God, that you would use your word tonight, encourage, convict, strengthen, Lord. Guide us into your truth tonight, Lord. Say what you have to say to us tonight, Lord. Speak to me and speak through me tonight, Lord. I pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Drive-through Christianity. We live in a drive-through world, a drive-through society. We have drive-through everything these days because we don't have time to actually sit down and, and do anything. We, we have drive-through restaurants. We have drive-through banks. Uh, now I'm, I've read online that the new fad is drive-through funeral homes. Apparently, this is a thing. I guess it started in California, uh, but now you can you can view your loved one if you if you don't want to waste time actually going to the funeral home and having to get out of your car and actually go in to see your your loved one. Uh, they'll just put him up by. You know, stand him up by a drive through window and you can just keep on rolling as you pay your last respects. There's a, I was reading about one funeral home in Memphis, Tennessee that I guess bought an old bank building and used the drive through window as a, as a drive through funeral display where, where you can now drive by and see your, your loved one in a, through a view him or her through a bulletproof glass. I'm thinking, why would you need bulletproof glass? They're already dead. They can't be any more dead than they already are. But, but uh, you know, I guess they're making use of the bank there. We live in a drive-through society. We live in a culture that is void of commitment and patience and perseverance. James is a book on the relation between faith and perseverance in the Christian life. Tonight I want us to look at three virtues that every Christian needs to run the what race to win. Three virtues that every Christian needs in order to run the race to win. The first is this, patience. You've got to have patience. And I know, I mean, like I said, my, you know, physician healed thyself. I'm probably the least patient person there is. But I, like I said, like I told you before, like waiting on God and waiting on people seem to be two different things uh, to, in my reckoning. But James here admonishes us to be patient. He says in verse 7, Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. He starts out brethren. Now this is important. He's writing to believers. He's writing to Christians. He's writing to people who have, who have made a commitment of faith to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But they need encouragement to hang on. They need encouragement to wait on the Lord. He says, be patient until the coming of the Lord. 
Christianity looks toward a goal. We're, we're looking forward to the coming of the Lord. It, it's not just a, just a, a day-by-day thing that we're doing here. It's not just joy and peace and blessing for today, but we're looking forward to a goal, the day that Jesus comes back and the kingdom is consummated. And he gives, as an example, the patience of a farmer. He gives a little illustration. With each of these points, James provides a little illustration for us. And this is what he says about the, the farmer. He says, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rains. So in Palestine, in Israel, in the Holy Land, their climate is pretty different than what we have in Oklahoma. They have hot, dry summers. And you say, well, that's kind of what we have here uh, this year. But they have hot, dry summers, and they have warm, wet winters. And so the rainy season is generally about October through March. That's kind of their rainy season. Now, you can pretty well count on the rain, you know, in the winter months. It's probably going to rain. But it was considered a, a special blessing by the Lord if you got the early rains in October, and the latter rains in March or April. And these were crucial in the, in the farming community, in the, the farming culture that they were, because you needed those, those early rains because that's what prepared the ground for planting the seed and prepared the seed to grow. So you plant the seed and, and you get those early rains and it sets those seeds and starts them to grow in. And then the latter rain was crucial because that's when your crops were ripening. That's when you were going to make the harvest. So right before the harvest, if you got those latter rains, you had a bumper crop. But if you didn't get the early rains and the latter rains, then you weren't going to have a very good crop at all. And the, the thing about a farming community, you always teetered be, between abundance and famine. Now, here's the thing about the early and the latter rains. There wasn't a thing in the world you could do about it. You couldn't make it rain. Uh, you couldn't, you know, hocus pocus any rain out of the sky. All you could do was prepare your field for rain, plant your plant your crop, and pray for the early and the latter rains that God would give the harvest. He uses this as an illustration of the Christian life. You and I can't control the circ. We have very little control over the circumstances around us. All we can do is like the farmer preparing the field to pre prepare our life to receive what God has for us and, and whatever, regardless of the circumstances and trust God to provide what we need. He says, to establish your hearts... You also, verse 8, you also be patient and establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. If you notice, that's in the imperative form. In other words, that's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's, it's a command that James gives believers. As, prepare your heart. Establish your heart. As, as a farmer would prepare uh, your, the, the land the, the field for planting, you prepare your heart uh, for w what God is bringing and th that you can have patience to stand firm is the idea. So the principle of the farmer is this. You reap what you sow. You'll reap what you sow. If, if the farmer is diligent and he prepares his field and he trusts God for the early and the latter rains, then he bears a crop, he bears fruit. But he will, the farmer will always reap what he sows and the Christian will reap what, we will reap what we sow. And so we have to be patient and continue to do it God's way. Because let me tell you, life gets very messed up when we don't do it God's way. You know, I, I listen to people's 
lives and testimonies and stories from their life. And, and I think, how in the world does a life get so messed up? Well, it gets so messed up because we don't do it God's way. I had an uncle. He's passed away probably, I don't know, 15 years ago or 20 maybe, somewhere along in there. He's been gone for a while. But he was my uncle by marriage. He married my, my aunt. Now that's only a little part of the story. The way he married my aunt was that he stole my aunt away from her first husband. Uh, so I, all I knew about my aunt and uncle were they, they seemed like miserable people. Like I never saw them happy. Like all the time I, I was around them as a kid growing up, they never seemed happy. They always seemed sad. They were alcoholics. Both of them were alcoholics. Uh, the, the, the only time I ever saw my uncle sober was when we went squirrel hunting, and he, he used to say, guns and alcohol don't mix, which that's probably the wisest thing my uncle ever said. But every other time I've ever seen my aunt or my uncle, they were always at some varying level of intoxication. Now, there's even more to the story. I'm told that long before I was ever born, long before my uncle hooked up with my aunt, that he used to be a preacher. This is what I was told. And uh, he, was, he was preaching, and a, a young preacher, and he was really... You know, he was, he was a good preacher and, and things were going good. God was using him. And, and, but for whatever reason, like he, he let the world get in the way of God in his life. And obviously, like, like all of that went out the window. Like, like, like there was no pre, but it's, he never, I never, he never went to church when I, all the time I knew him. He never went to church. He never, uh, he never talked about being a preacher. I heard that from somebody else, not from him. The only thing that he ever said to me when, when I surrendered the ministry, he told me, he said, well, Mark, it's good that you're doing it when you're young before you make a lot of mistakes that people won't forgive because God will forgive you, but people won't. Well, I guess there's some truth to that as well. But he always, he just always was so, I felt so sorry for for him because I knew his life could have been so much more than it ended up being. I've thought a lot about it. Was, was my uncle saved? Did he go to heaven? And I don't know, and I'm not, I'm not the Lord and I'm not the judge, so I can't speak definitively on that. I'll say what I think. I think that he probably was saved, and I think that he probably went to heaven. I don't know that, but I, I think he probably did. But here's what I also think. I think he missed an incredible amount of blessing on this earth, in this life. He missed that abundant life that Jesus talks about. Why? Because he didn't have the patience to run the race to the finish. He started out well. He, he started out on the right track. He started out on the right foot, but he didn't have the patience to see it through. Like the farmer who plants a crop and then forgets about it and never tends it and never sees to it, just hoping everything will turn out all right. But friends, trust me, life gets very messed up when we don't do it God's way. And so patience is the virtue that we as Christians need to run the race to win. The second virtue is prudence. Prudence, or we might say wisdom or discernment, however you want to think. I was trying to come up with words that started with P, so that's where we come up with prudence, but uh, the idea there is, is wis godly wisdom is the idea there. He says in verse 9, do not grumble against one another. The word grumble there, it means something like to sigh or Grown due to unpleasant circumstances. And, and that's, that's what we do a lot of times. He says, don't grumble against one another, brethren. When we get in unpleasant circumstances, things don't go our way or, or things don't turn out like we want to, we take it out on those that we love the most. 
We, we just do. That's why husbands fuss at wives and moms fuss at kids. That's why kids fuss at dads. That's why church folks fuss at one another because, because we get in a situation in our life where circumstances are not pleasant and so we, we think that it's an easy target to grumble against or, or at or toward the people that love us the most because it's safe because they're always going to love us and they're always going to take us back. But James says we ought to have wisdom not to attack one another. Don't grumble against one another lest you be condemned because the judge is standing at the door. We ought to live our lives and treat one another just like Jesus is standing right beside us because he is. And if you wouldn't say something to somebody with Jesus standing right beside you, then you shouldn't say it at all because he is standing right beside us, right? He says the judge is at the door. And the example of prudence that James gives us is the prophets. He says, my brethren, verse 10, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. They spoke in the name of the Lord and they endured suffering with patience. He says, we count them blessed. We don't, it's an odd thing to say. We, we count them blessed because they suffered. But they endured the suffering with patience. So the principle of the prophets is this, to live for Christ is to carry his cross. What did you think that you were getting into when you signed up to follow Jesus? Did you think a life of ease? Did you think that, you know, uh, smooth sailing, that everything was going to be easy and grand? To, to follow Jesus is to carry a cross. To live for Christ is to carry a cross. And how thankful are you for being able to carry the cross. We tend to think in terms of, uh, of I'm thankful when all my circumstances work out where I can be comfortable. When was the last time you thanked Jesus for a cross to carry, a burden to bear? Corey Tinboom writes in her book, The Hiding Place, she and her family were prisoners in a Nazi concentration camp in World War II, if you, if you know the story of Corey Ten Boom. Anyway, so she was, she and her sister were in, I guess, in the same um, cell in this concentration camp, and they had smuggled in a Bible, which was, you know, totally off off limits for prisoners in a, in a uh, concentration camp, but somehow or another they had smuggled in a Bible. And every evening they would gather together, they would huddle together and they would hide and they would read the Bible together. And the, the cell, the place they were being held, it was infested with all kinds of my, uh, mice and bug fleas and lice and all kinds of creatures and Corey's sister, Betsy, told her, said, I, in, in 1 Thessalonians, it says to give thanks in everything. And I'm going to put that into practice. And I'm even, I'm, I'm going to be thankful that we're here in this concentration camp. And Corey said, how can you be thankful? It's overrun with lice and fleas. She said, it doesn't say to be thankful in pleasant circumstances. It says to be thankful in everything. And I'm going to thank God for the lice and the fleas. And Corey said, there's no way that not even God can make me thankful for lice and fleas. But they went on and, and every night they would gather together and they would... They would huddled together and they would read this contraband Bible that they had. And every night, Betsy would thank God for the lice 
and the fleas. Corey always wondered why it was that the guards left them alone. Like they would come in and, you know, search other, other areas, other places in the concentration camp. But they never came in their cell to search. If they ever were to search, they'd have been found with that Bible and then they really would have been in trouble, probably be put to death at that point. But they never did. They never took their Bible away. One day, Corey found out why they never did. Because the guards didn't want to go into that cell because that cell was infested with lice and fleas. And so the guards stayed away. So those, those lice and fleas that Betsy was thankful for is what allowed them to stay alive and continue to study God's word through, uh, through the, the horror that was the Holocaust. I wonder if we're thankful for the lice and the, and the fleas in our life. I wonder if we're thankful in everything, in all of the circumstances, knowing that, that to serve the Lord is to carry a cross. It's not going to be easy, but it will be rewarding to know that God is using you, that, that God has counted you worthy to suffer for his name. And finally, we as believers need perseverance. In verse 11, he says, we count them blessed who endure. You know, that's not what most Christians believe, that you are blessed when you endure suffering. When we talk about count your many blessings, we're not generally talking about lice and fleas, are we? We, we, want, we want our circumstances to turn out well so that we can be comfortable and happy and have things going our way. I'm struck by, in Acts chapter 5, where it says the apostles were beaten and forbidden to ever speak the name of Jesus again. And it says they went on their way rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Not that they made up their mind that they would suffer through. That's not what it says. Or that they just were determined uh, to make the best of a bad situation. No, it says they went on their way rejoicing that they were found worthy to suffer shame for his name. And, in, and every, every day from house to house, they kept right on preaching and teaching Jesus as the Christ. We count them blessed who endure. In other words, to take what the world doles out. Do you have enough grit in your crawl to take what the world doles out? To take the world's best punch and, and, and still remain standing for Christ. And the example here that James gives is, is the perseverance of Job. He gives, he gives Job as an example. He says, you've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. The end intended by the Lord was how the book, if you only, people usually don't like the book of Job because it's depressing because all they see in it is here was a righteous man who was made to suffer for no reason, that's what people think, that's what people say, uh, just because there's some sort of cosmic chess game going on between God and Satan. That's not what the book is about at all. If you keep on reading, you find out that Job wasn't quite as faithful as he thought he was. Job wasn't quite as righteous as he thought he was. And if you keep on reading to the end of the book, it says the last state of Job was better than the first. I don't think that's just because his, his fortunes were restored and his cattle were restored and his, his, all of his friends liked him again. I don't think that's the idea there, or at least not the totality of the idea. 
I think Job, the last state of Job was better than the first because Job was a better man in the end. For having gone through the trials and the suffering, he, he got to experience God in a way that he never would have if everything would have gone along smoothly. Listen, no trial is, is pleasant to endure, but endure it with patience and persevere and you will experience God in ways that you never would have if everything would have gone along smoothly. The principle of Job is this, that trials, today's trials are not the end of the story. God is compassionate and merciful. That's the lesson from Job. That's the lesson that most people miss. But he says, You've seen the end intended by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. The point of Job, the story of Job is that God is compassionate and merciful. So compassionate and merciful that he allowed Job to be tested so that the last state of Job would be better than the first. Here's what I know. There's no glory, no honor, no blessing in quitting. I uh, had a chance on a mission trip one time to upstate New York to go to this place called Ascension Rock. Now, I don't know if you know anything about it, uh, have heard about it, but apparently back in the 1800s, there was a minister named William Miller and he got obsessed with all the prophecies of Daniel and all that, and he thought he had it figured out exactly when Jesus is coming back. Now, can I just tell you straight up, anytime somebody thinks they've got it figured out the exact day when Jesus is coming back, they don't. I, I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to be on whatever day somebody is predicting. If somebody's predicting a date, you can pretty well be sure that Whatever day Jesus comes back, it probably won't be that day. But this guy, his name was William Miller, and he began to teach that Jesus was coming back October 22nd, 1844. And he convinced all of his followers that this was when Jesus was coming back. And so they, they were to rid themselves of all the worldly cares and concerns of this world. So they went out, they quit their jobs, they sold their homes, they sold all their property. They all, on the morning of, of October 22nd, 1844, they all climbed to the top of this mountain to a large rock outcropping that we now, that is now called Ascension Rock because that was the rock that they thought they were all going to get taken up to heaven when Jesus comes back. They're going to meet Jesus in the air. And so they, they all went out there. They all put on white robes and they started the morning singing. The sun came up and they were singing hymns of praise to Jesus. And the day rocked on and they kept singing. Jesus didn't come back. Morning turned to afternoon. Jesus still hadn't come back. They sang just about every song they knew. They, they had sang so much they were hoarse by now and, and Jesus still hadn't come back. And as the sun set down over the mountain, the reality began to set in. Jesus isn't coming back today. And what do you do? You've put your whole life into this one idea that Jesus is coming back today. I'll tell you what a lot of them did. They got very mad at William Miller, which I don't blame them, I would too. If, if somebody had duped me into thinking that Jesus was coming back today and I just quit my job and sold my house and stood on a rock all day and Jesus didn't come back, I'd be pretty aggravated as well. A lot of them just turned away and walked away from church completely. No no. Uh, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't want anything to do with God. They didn't want anything to do with preachers anymore. They didn't believe any of it. William Miller, trying to salvage what he did, came up with this, this idea, this thought that, well, Jesus really did come back. 
Yeah, right, he did. Jesus really did come back, but when he came back, he saw that people weren't uh, obeying all of the, the Old Testament laws, like keeping the Sabbath and all the dietary laws and everything. And so he was just so disappointed with the church that he just couldn't take them back. And so he left until the church started doing it right, and then he was going to come back again. Well, the, the offshoot, the spin out of that became what is now the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. I don't know how closely they want to associate themselves with the man, William Miller, but that was the movement that spun into the Seventh-day Adventist church. I say all that to say this. We're not given the day when Jesus is coming back. We're told that he's coming back. We're told that he's coming back soon. However, the people that told us he's coming back soon lived 2,000 years ago. So soon, when you're dealing with the Lord, soon is a very relative term. My question to you is this. Not what would you do if Jesus comes back today. A lot of times preachers use that, and I've used that too. What would you do right now if you knew Jesus was coming back today? That's not the question I ask you tonight. The question I ask you tonight is this. What if Jesus doesn't come back today? What are you going to do? What if Jesus doesn't come back tomorrow? What are you going to do? You're going to just drag up and quit? You, you, you're going to throw up your hands and walk away like the people on Ascension Rock and just say, well, I, I followed Jesus thinking things were going to be good and all of a sudden circumstances turned bad for me. You know, a lot of people do that. Jesus talked about the seed that fell on, on stony ground that, that with, came up for a moment, but when the sun was hot, it faded away because there was no root. A lot of people, they start off in what seems like a for real relationship with Jesus, but before long, when things get hot in this world, and they do, they fade away because there's no root. Maybe Jesus comes back before sundown. Wouldn't that be great? What are you going to do if he don't? Maybe Jesus will come back tomorrow. Wouldn't that be wonderful? What are you going to do if you don't? What are you going to do in the morning if Jesus doesn't come back tonight? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and how you challenge us, how you speak to us, God. I pray, Lord, as we come to this time of decision that you would speak to us right now. Search our hearts, God, and see if there are decisions that we need to make. Lead us to those decisions now. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.